last two videos that I had made, uh, my computer couldn't hold them, so therefore they never got recorded. And there was nothing I could do about it, but I do know that whenever God says something through me, he will bring it back. He will definitely bring it back. And those two videos were very important for women, for women who live with husbands uh, and they separate themselves and they think that they are the only ones that have God. And it's just not true. Because your other half is separating himself from you, positive that he's the only one that has God. And so therefore you two have a reflection of each other. Is he's positive God made him the head and you have no business uh, not doing everything he tells you to do and that you can't have God without him. That's as sure as you thinking that uh, he doesn't have God because he's such a tyrant and a dictator. And so you, you just keep going like this and you keep missing each other. You keep missing the way God wants you to be. For God, although he says he puts a sword between you, a sword is a sword of truth. And so when he cuts through with the truth, it gives it the ability to manifest what is right and what is wrong. And with the macho man who is positive, their wife can never have anything without them because God made him the head. And the woman who is positive that her husband could never have anything without her because she is spiritual and she knows that she loves and she knows that she's obedient. She knows she's doing everything that she possibly can to make her marriage work. And he's just contrary to it. He's contrary to it because he's competing and he is, uh, he is just plain contrary. He's, he's, uh, he's going to prove you that you're wrong and he's right. And when he can't, see, because some men aren't strong enough in the Lord. Some men don't want to be strong in the Lord. And so when they look at you and they see how holy you really are, it scares them. It scares them into believing that they should be like you. They should act like you and think like you, and they are not. And so they get angry, and they get so angry because they are positive as they look at you that they're going to hell. So they throw their hands up in the air, and they figure, what's the use of even trying? I can never be like her, and I, never, I can never serve God the way she does. And God knows that, and because he knows that, and I can't get there, uh, there's just no use. I'm headed for hell, and there's nothing I can do about it. So I just might as well. And, and, and criminals think this way. They, they get caught in a situation, and it's not so bad. But if they're going to go to jail, they might as well make it worth its while. So they do as much as they, damage as they possibly could, because if they're going to suffer, they're going to suffer for a reason. Well, this is the way a man thinks many times. And I, oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about every man. I'm talking about men who have been convinced by pastors, preachers, teachers, all of them have all convinced him that he must be the head of his house. He must have absolute control in order to have control over his children. And the fear of not doing that drives him to such a degree that he overrides it on his children. He overrides everywhere because he's afraid he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing and he doesn't realize that's not what God called him to. God called him in the fear of God, which gives him unusual understanding. And with that understanding, he would have wisdom to know how to be with his wife and be kind, be gentle, be generous, knowing that she's a weaker vessel. He would know how to treat his children the way Christ would treat them. But you see, he can't do that because he's been taught so different in the back of his mind what He's afraid. He's afraid when he sees someone who is a bad influence. He's afraid that influence is going to take over his children. He doesn't realize that if he was where God wanted him to be, nothing can take over his children. If he was where he was supposed to be, 
nothing could hinder his wife. But he doesn't, he doesn't go to that kind of headship. He doesn't do what Christ did. He doesn't love his body, his, his wife, as his own body. He separates from her as though she's nothing and he's everything. And that is not what marriage is about. Because he says, do benevolence, that you give each other due respect. And, and I've said it, and I'll say it again. God said, male and female made he them. And he said, he told them to be fruitful and multiply. He told them, he called them Adam. Now, he didn't call them Adam and Eve. He called them Adam. Read it in the King James Version of the Bible in just Genesis. He called them Adam, meaning she is part of all mankind. You can't separate her. He called her equal to Adam. He really did because she's a human being who is has a mind, has a spirit, has a body, has just like your children do. But when you try to override that and you try to prove that you are the only one that has anything, you are up the wrong tree. You are doing the wrong tree. I am not a scholar. I don't want to be a scholar. I want to be what God called me to be, what he trained me to be. He knows that there's a whole new flock of people that are going to come in that are not going to be able to do what you do, who have peace of mind, have the ability to study, have the ability to have everything organized, have the ability. He, he knows there are people that are going to come out of great chaos and atrocities. And where are they going to go? I always think of the young man who had a big, long, ugly beard and, uh, he had on uh, a jacket that was leather and the way he was dressed was really awful. But he had worked with uh, motorcycle gangs and he was a pastor there. So he comes and he sits in the church and they ask him to leave. He can't sit there because he's not dressed properly. And if I know the man, he is very holy. He, he lives a righteous life. And yet you have the gall because he's not like you to kick him out. And, and if somebody in a suit that had a lot of money came in, you would welcome him and be impressed and so happy. And the Bible tells you, don't do that. But you still do it. You don't want to work with someone that is a lot of work to get to where they want to go. I do. You know, I do. Even even when I seen it in kindergarten that nobody wanted this one little boy, and I'm going to send him to me because I wanted him. I didn't care what kind of problems he had. I loved him. And I know he loved me. But people's mouths destroy everything. But that's what I'm trying to explain to you. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love covers everything. Prophecy is going to pass away, so all that you studied is going to be gone. Tongues is going to pass away, so all the hours you spent thinking that all you had to do was pray in tongues. When you don't understand what you're praying, and he said, Paul the Apostle said, I prayed more in tongues than you all. But I would rather pray one prayer with understanding than pray with tongues. That's why I said that when I pray in tongues, I make sure I get it to interpretation. And boy, does revelation come whenever I wait on God for the interpretation. So tongues, gifts of any kind that all pass away. Everything he said is going to pass away except for love. So if you do not have love guiding you when you're with a person when you meet a person when you, if the love is not guiding you you see all kinds of things could guide you you could want to impress them because you want to take them to church that's not God that's you you could want to uh, uh, have their compassion and their sympathy because you have a need that's not God 
that's you. You can have all kinds of feelings to obtain what you want, and it's still not God, that's you. But if you have an unconditional love, asking for nothing back, nothing in return, like every one of you, there, I know there's trollers, and, and I answer some of them because God tells me to, not because I have to, not because I'm offended, not because it bothers me or troubles me, but God tells me on certain ones that there's a possibility they may hear the truth. So I answer them. And I give them the chance that God says. Now, if God told me to answer them 10 times, I would. But if he tells me to answer them once, I do. I do what he tells me to do, which is hard and difficult for some of you to fathom because you can't even hear his voice. You, you don't even know. When you judge, you judge according to the flesh and according to the eyes because you did not die to self. You know, when you take scripture and you say, well, God came and, and now you can do everything and anything because God gave it to you and it's all by faith and by the, we're the children of Abraham. So you do whatever unrighteous thing that you want to do. You judge as many people as you want to judge and it never occurs to you. That's not God's will. He's holy. He's righteous. He is not going to come to you and give you the heart and mind of any people. He just is not going to do it. If you wait, God will more than likely give you to the, the answers to a lot of questions that you do have. You want to know how I think and feel about things. You want to know what I believe. Well, you know what? If my testimonies do not prove to you what I believe, if all of my videos, which I've made quite a few of them, you need more to prove to you what I believe, then you know what? There's not going to be anything that is going to convince you of what I believe. Because if you don't understand all the things that I went through, I went through so that I could come here and tell them to you and help you to understand enough that you can go and find God that you can go into the work. See, this is totally different than somebody believing that I am trying to teach and show you something. No, I'm not. All I want to do is lead you to Jesus. Go to him, not to pastors, not to preachers, not to teachers, not to friends, not to neighbors, just him. And get alone with him and find your way wherever you are and with whomever you are. And if you are with a group of scholars, that's great. That's your calling. You go with them. But don't use my channel to teach anybody anything. Because I'm not here to do that with them. I am here to help them find that they can have Jesus Christ equal to you in spite of what they don't know. In spite of what they don't understand. Because some of them can never be like you. Because they're more like me. And I, when I say more like me, is is they are they have been through a lot of things. And they have people like you keeping them down where they can never find God. They can never hear him. They're positive. They have you lifted up the ear the way you want them to. That you're the only one that knows anything. You're the only one. That, well, God don't want that. We are all equal. I'm not teaching these people that I'm any better than they are. I'm not telling anybody that I am higher than they are. But if you pick on me and you think that you're going to destroy what God is building up, when you pick on me, then you're going to answer to God, not to me. Because I have nothing to do with the call that he gave me. If I had my way and God knows him, if you read my book, I fought him tooth and nail. I said, I will never do this. I don't want to do this. Stop it, Lord. Don't give me the word. Don't give me the book. Don't give me anything. I don't want to. I've seen what those people out there do. I've seen where they f are so fickle-minded and they play games and they think because they have a little bit of knowledge, they know everything. And they destroy one another and they judge one another and they hurt one another. And they're wounded or so bad they can't even get up. But that one that thinks that they are judged is so happy and they're sitting in a throne calling it God's throne. Like the one told me that uh, <laughs> you can't bring Christ into you because then he's he's taken up the throne. I, 
I really couldn't read all of it because of my eyesight, which I thank God I can't because I don't want to know it. All I want to know is this. When I invited Jesus Christ into my heart, there was so much of me there. I couldn't even see him or hear me. All I saw was my fears, my lack of understanding, my problems, my ignorance. That's all I saw. Just the same way, that's all you see. All I saw was what so-and-so said about me, what so-and-so did to me, what so-and-so, that is all I saw. But when Jesus Christ started taking on the throne of my heart, and he takes it with God the Father and God the Son, when he started doing that, then I began to see. How did that happen? Because I sought him. I searched after God. How do you feel about this God? What do you think about that God? What I didn't ask you what you think. I didn't ask you what you believe. It didn't matter to me what you think and you believe. What mattered to me was what he thought and what he believed. That's why I didn't search prophecy. That's why I didn't search healing. That's why I didn't search anything. But healing came upon me. Prophecy came upon me. And God just kept dousing me in it. And giving it to me. Even though I fought him tooth and nail and begged him, don't do it. I don't want it. I did. Oh, you don't think I did, but I did. And I wrote it in a book. I went through so many things for so many years with my heart. So much. And each time, 225 beats per minute, he would heal that. 199 beats per minute, right in front of people, he would see it just come down and stay that way. It would be 225 and they would rush me down to the uh, basement of the hospital to use the paddles on me. And just before they put the paddles on me, it goes into sinus rhythm of 72. And then they rushed me back upstairs. And one doctor was there. And, the, and when I came back down the second time, he had a hold of a newspaper and he held it in front of him and he goes like this. He's holding it in front of him and then he goes, pulls it down and goes, boo, like that. And I just looked at him and he said, well, maybe it scared the fit out of, fib out of you the first time. Maybe it'll work this time. From that I know, of, they never did put the paddles on me except for years later in a different situation. But after open heart surgery, hole in my heart, a pacemaker, uh, another leaky valve, and they told me you have to have this experimental vac cause, valve because the leak is so big, there's no way you can survive it, there's no way your your legs are going to swell, Your everything is going to happen to you, you have to have this. And I said, no, nope, I'm not. Well, I just got examined yesterday with a sonogram. And they called me up and they said, Mrs. Lynch, your heart is excellent. It is so strong. Everything that was ever done in your heart is working perfectly. It is in excellent condition. Now, how could that happen? If I would have listened to this one say, you do it this way. If I listened to that one say, you do it this way. All I know is he told me to seek him out, listen to him, obey his voice, and obey no other. And that is what I do. And when he gives me this messages, these messages to give to you, I'm going to give them. You can kick and scream and hate and lie and do whatever you want. You can encourage me like many of you do. Thank, I thank God for that. That's wonderful. But I put no trust in man. I don't, I don't put, I don't put any trust in what this mouth says by any man. I don't listen to flattery. I don't pay attention to someone saying, you're so great. I've seen it destroy people. Oh, you sing much better than them. You should sing. And the woman couldn't sing a lick. Oh, you're such more beautiful than they are. And the woman was rather ugly. Oh, you just, nobody like you. You are just so great. Don't come around me. I don't want to hear it. I know better. 
I can look in the mirror. I could understand. I could read my, see my videos. I understand. I know who I am and I know where I'm at. And I'm not going to listen to the naysayers tell me well, you should do it this way and you should. It. Well, go correct God. Because you can't correct him in my life. You're not going to get that opportunity. So I am going to erase. One asked me, why would you erase the messages? Well, knowing that I am part Hispanic, because my mother was pure Polish. Knowing that I was half Hispanic, they were asking me questions. Why would you do this for your people? No, those aren't my people. My people are here in America. My relatives were born here in America. My dad, although he was Hispanic, he was born in America. He, his family came over the right way. He didn't do this kind of garbage that they're doing now. And he learned how to speak English so fluently that you, you couldn't tell that he was ever, ever in Mexico. So why would you even send me anything like that? Why would you assume that these are my people? They're not. My people are here in America. I do not have any feelings towards anybody in Mexico. I don't. My feelings come first here, then, and I've gone to Mexico to preach, then I have compassion over there, but I've got to take care of here first. If you don't, the Bible says, if you don't take care of your home first, you are worse than an infidel. I tried to trace my relatives that back here and I couldn't, there's no way to find them. No, there's no relatives back there for me. And so there's no way you can trace them. And that's okay with me, because if God wanted it any different, he would have done it. But I am not Mexican. I am an American. I am not. I asked them one time at the hospital, why, why is it that if you are one quarter Hispanic, they insist that you write you are Hispanic? Why is it that if you're three quarters white, Heinz 57, all white, born in America. And you can trace back to uh, the 15th century. Why are you considered Hispanic? Their answer to me was because everybody that are from those different countries are subject to different kinds of diseases and they are in different things and they want to know how to treat you. Well, that sounds reasonable. I, I can accept that. But it is so, so funny that a person could have be one-eighth Hispanic and they insist that they label themselves as Hispanic. Not that I'm ashamed of Hispanics. I love them. I love them. I love them all colors. The most beautiful people in the world that I've ever known. They're Filipinos. They're Asian. They're, they're uh, Mexican. They're Polish. They're Romanian. Beautiful people, all people. So why should I pick out one and say, well, those are my people? No, they're not. No, they're not at all. My people are those that follow after Jesus Christ. The love that I have for those that love him. But that doesn't mean I don't love those that are unlovely and don't want him. So God says, when you bring up gender, when you bring up these things, all you're doing is feeding confusion. So I'm asking you, let me alone. I, I'm going to start shutting people off for talking about that stuff. If you want to know something about how to live for Jesus, how to overcome him over your body, mind, and your spirit, I'll answer it all day long. But when you start pouring on scripture, this formula meets this form to show me how smart you are. That's wrong. That is totally wrong because all you're doing is confusion, every, confusing every person that's looking for him to know how. Some maybe some wife is suffering real bad and she does not know how to treat her husband spiritually. Maybe some child is hurting real bad This does not know how to treat her own mother or father differently like, you know and you come along and show how smart you are I've had enough of it if you find yourself removed just write to me about the subjects on hand 
that I am preaching about. And if you want to find fault with it, you're going to get erased. Because I'm telling you, I don't have time to argue over the Word of God, fight over the Word of God. I don't have time for it. There are too many people out there that need the truth, and I'm going to give it to them whether anybody likes it or not. I'm going to pave the way for Jesus Christ to come in the rapture, that these people who think and have been taught and told that they are nothing and never will be anything in the church find out that they're going to sit in the highest seat with God. And those of you that think because you're so smart, because you studied so much, because you went here, because you went to college there, you went, those of you that are positive that you are better than them, you're going to find out you're not. So you better come down off your high horse and start thinking about people who are in their own minds. They consider themselves way less than you. And that is so, so sad. They should consider themselves at least an equal. At least an equal. You should give them at least an equal. But many of you can't because you don't believe anybody is equal to you. If you don't believe a woman is equal to you, you don't believe anybody is. Because you can't, if you can't step down off of that lordship of ruling over people and ruling over your family and ruling over, over your church, ruling, I'm talking about ruling. I'm not talking about being head. I told you, head is a, is a protection. It's a responsibility that you are to fight off demons from your wife. You are to fight off demons from your family. But you can't do that. Because you're too busy pretending to be something that you're not. So the devil has a field there and you go, aha, see, I told you she was like that. And then you go with your child that you're not protecting. You're letting the devil have. You say, aha, I told you that he was going to fall that way. What in the world is the matter with you? Why can't you see what you've been called to do? You have been called to protect them. You have been called to intervene and pray for them. But you're too, too positive you're the only one that has him. And then women do the same exact thing. The man who, who thinks he's the only one, the woman thinks she's the only one. That's, and both of you are at your each other's throat competing. And you've got to learn to grow up and get out of this.